the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. In last week's edition of Challenge 2.0, we talked with a documentary producer who explored the impact of our criminal justice system, not only on those in prison, but on their families and even entire communities. We continue our exploration of changes needed to keep prison from becoming a life sentence for every crime and for extended generations. We also hear from faith leaders who are seeking to end what they call the addiction to throwing away human lives and the gifts that they carry with them. He was 18 years old at the time of the crime. You don't know who he's going to be 20 years on. It's about being able to see the commodity that I've become, and not the commodity that I once was. For a lot of those kids, I don't think that they've matured enough to calculate the consequences of their action. He was 11, and the gangs were already starting the recruiting process. A lot of answers that people in society are seeking will be found in prison. We've caused pain. But we caused pain primarily because we was in pain. The Black Prisoners Caucus is about liberation. The more that we begin to educate ourselves, the more empowered we become. We've created a support group for positivity in the most unlikely of environments. You're never too old to find that peace with yourself. Victims are perpetrators, perpetrators of victims. And we're all victims of this system. And so as we did last week, I'd like to uh, welcome three very special guests. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Gilda Shepard, uh, who is the director, writer, and executive producer of the film of which we just offered a very brief trailer since I've been down, and also a professor at Evergreen State College at their Tacoma campus. Gilda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jeff, for having me, all of us. <laughs> and would also like to uh, welcome Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown of Plymouth Congregational Church. Uh, Kelly, it's a delight to have you back with us again. Thank you for joining us as well. I'm so grateful to be here. And also would like to welcome again Rabbi Jay Rosenbaum, Rabbi Emeritus of Herzl Ner Tamid. And Rabbi, thank you so much, not only for joining us uh, last week, but also in this continued conversation this week. A pleasure to be here, Jeff. The opening trailer that we saw, I think, makes it clear the extent of this problem. And I know that the book, The New Jim Crow, has been seminal, really, in your developing this topic, Gilda, and in our understanding. Uh, I remember reading it and uh, just having to sort of shake my head and saying, this is true. I know this to be true, but I can't believe it's really true. Uh, I'd like each of you to maybe comment not only on the systemic nature of this and as you've seen it play out, but also how this speaks against the supposed ideals of our country and uh, the ideals and the core tenets of each of our faiths. These present conditions um, that Michelle Alexander unraveled are uh, not only systemic, but systemic historically. And it navigates the culture of punishment, right? I mean, if you think about Jim Crow, where there was segregated South right after um, the alleged emancipation, right, of enslaved Africans, um, that there was a boom in incarceration, you know, and so, and all these laws like black black codes and those kinds of things, well, you can still see them today. It was not only in boom in 1865 of, of black people being in prison and poor people, but also as you moved on, it became black people, poor people, immigrants, refugees. Mm -hmm. And if you moved on, it became worse and worse and worse. It keeps gathering, right? And then once a person gets out, it's the um, 
um, the stigma of being incarcerated because you have to put it down. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of um, what what do we think about incarcerated people? First of all, the prisons are far away. And Rabbi Jay always reminds me is that we a lot oftentimes because of this cultural punishment that um, their humanity is gone. So hence, just like in Jim Crow, housing, food, um, um, medical care, public health, those kinds of things, getting a job, getting education, getting counseling. You know, and so it creates this culture of punishment and increases these um, makes legal. Mm-hmm. Right. And some people, these disparities. You know, there's a reason why we got rid of uh, um, allegedly got rid of um, parole is because of the racism in parole. People of color weren't getting parole. And now mm-hmm. we have a clemency hearings uh, and this uh, um, a way of dealing with things. And there's still that complaint. So those kinds of systemic things that are harboring on racism, particularly, and I dare say sexism, class bias, Mm -hmm. and even how you sometimes think about things and and also how you criminalize children. You know, when in my classroom, there was a 13 year, um, a person had been in prison for since he was 13. Now, since he was 13 and he was 23. Yes, he committed a violent crime, but he was 13. So the way we um, uh, punish children, you know, and now there's a brain science that wants to change that. But all those things um, reflect Jim Crow, reflect a systemic uh, problem and gives a, um, this one, um, uh, Austin Surratt says, um, how we punish says more about us than those we punish, you know? And I think that, you know, this systemic problem um, helps to encourage that punishment. But I have faith, you what, but you know, working with Rabbi Jay and Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown and their development of this multi faith group, mm-hmm. if you hear about that, then you will say, that's democracy. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, I want to get, and Rabbi Jay, why don't we start with you? in terms of your reaction to the systemic nature of this and also what it says about how well we actually live out our faith traditions. Yeah, I want to build on what Gilda said. I think I totally agree that how we punish uh, says a lot. Not only how we punish, but how often we punish and who we punish uh, says a lot about our society. And I think this whole issue of mass incarceration is symptomatic of an even deeper problem that we have with the whole society. It affects everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I go back to, um, uh, you know, the, the Bible. The first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, really uh, shows us the path. It's, it shows that in the early stories of the Bible, you see a tendency to divide the world into, into good and evil, you know, good guys and bad guys. And you just, and all you have to do is get rid of the bad guys and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the Bible, one of the most powerful stories of the Bible is, is the story of Joseph, where, where the bad guys are, are us, you know, the bad guys are part of our family, right? And you can't dismiss those quote unquote bad guys because everybody's a little bit bad and everybody's a little bit good. And the beauty of that story is it's a story about human transformation. It shows that the, 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 the true path that God wants us to follow is not to get rid of the people we think are evil. The truth path is, is, to, is to change our community as a whole so that um, um, brothers are not, are not um, brothers and sisters are not fighting with each other, are not demonizing each other. And we have a situation in America right now mm-hmm. where we've turned everybody into the bad guy. Right? Mm-hmm. You, know, you, start by, you start by thinking that you can limit that that dismissing of people to to people on the on the so-called bottom of society you do you keep on doing that you keep on doing it over and over again before you know it your next door neighbor is the bad guy mm-hmm. you know your 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 democratic rival your republican rival is the bad guy we've demonized half the country right and it starts with mass incarceration that's a symptom of a, of a much deeper problem reverend brown what are your observations Yes, thank you. We we have no um, boundaries to the ways that we criminalize. And I, I agree with you, um, Rabbi, in that I was reading today as I was preparing for coming, there's a young woman in Iowa who was um, trafficked and um, raped. And she is um, 
involved in this justice system now because she is being forced to pay $150,000 of um, reparations to the family of the uh, one she killed who happened to be the one who raped her. Mm. Where Where is the, um, I can't even get my head around um, how that is so not justice and how we really don't have a sense of what justice even looks like. Mm -hmm. um, Cornel West says that um, justice is what love looks like in public. We, we have forgotten that we belong to one another. You're focusing on understanding that connection that is part of community. And part of that is education. And I know Gilda, as a professor, as an educator, uh, you've seen it in your classroom. What difference, if you'd just elaborate on that for all of us, what difference does having an education or not having an education make for the people that end up incarcerated? And when they can access that, what difference does that make? Um, if you look at the prison population and you look at the demographics of that, you will see that the overwhelming majority don't have a high school education. Now, that doesn't mean that our, 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 our education system is, is doing such a great job. But mm -hmm. when you see that as a pattern, if you see that as a pattern, you know it informs, not determines again, but informs the, the non-negotiable pathway, I think, to going to prison, oftentimes. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not a single factor. So education has always been a site of, of resistance. It's always been a site where we tried to integrate. We wanted to train the, change the curriculum. We had multicultural education. Sometimes it was like multicultural education, right? Tacos on Tuesday, those kinds of things. But education helps people to critically think. Mm -hmm. They don't just find themselves on the margin. They look at some of the policies that put them there. While at the same time with that, seeing that there are possibilities. So seeing their role in the decision-making as mm -hmm. well. So responsibility. So education, particularly across significant differences. And I, and I mean a kind of liberatory education that happens with the Black Prisoners Caucus and what Kamanti Carter started, the TEACH program, where he went across to, as Rabbi Jay was saying, to white nationalists. He went across to other gang members who were Latinx, uh, Pacific Islanders. Be because in prison, if you have over seven years, there are many programs that you can't take mm -hmm. unless there is a volunteer organization that comes into prison, like Freedom uh, Project that, I mean, Freedom um, Education Project of Puget Sound at the women's prison and University Beyond Bars at, the, at uh, many of the men's prisons. Now that is some community who got together, but systemically and as a policy, if you have over two, uh, seven years, you can't get an education. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a prison official said that once teach, that's taking education and creating history that the Black Prisoners Caucus created through the, through um, Kamanti Carter was the, the, the person who really pushed that. They said that violence has gone down because of that. There was an education program in the women's prison that was called the Women's Village. And the Women's Prison was the most violent prison in Washington State. Once Tanya Wilson, who was in my, it was in our film since I've been down, and her colleagues started the Women's Village and they started teaching one another. Mm -hmm. Not only teaching one another, you know, to get them ready for, to take a GED, but also, you know, things that of, of the mind, like healthy thinking, nonviolent communication, environmental racism, those kinds of things. So they, they took care of the whole person. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason why the, the, the teachers are on strike. I, maybe they went back today. And it's not just for pay. They wanted more resources for uh, students who, teach, who speak a second language. Right? They mm -hmm. wanted more counselors and those kinds of things. So sometimes even our educational system reflects some of the problems that we see in prison. So this culture of um, looking at 
education, not as liberation, but as I'm going to take it away from you and I'm going to punish you and not mm -hmm. see it that once we we able to interrogate, gate, you know, ourselves and the system that we can probably be a better person and make better decisions. You talked about the obstacle that inmates face, particularly those that are serving longer terms. And I'd like to just briefly go to a clip from your film that talks about that program uh, that's called Teach. So if we can just show that for a moment. The priority for our education department is those individuals with seven years or less on their sentence. So if you have more than seven years, which a lot of people do, you don't get a chance to get an education. We wanted to get professors to be able to come out here, but we was too far. So the next thing was, do we either let this program go to waste or do we figure out a way to make it flow? So the way that we came up with was, we'll just teach the classes. Just work backwards from here, and then we're just going to move on. So we just walk. And we knew that we could teach math. We knew that we could teach writing. And so it was more about the skill sets that we already had and being able to just really nurture those and provide those in a classroom setting. Two and eight. All right. And so y equals four. So negative and a negative is positive. All right. We reached out to a lot of prisoners, right? Guys who had degrees and all that type of stuff. But then we also quickly came to the realization just because you have a degree doesn't mean that you can teach. I think as we look at this movie, many are going to be moved to ask, well, what can I do? And I think, Gilda, I'd like to begin with you. What would you like people to do? How would you like them to react and put that reaction into action? I would like for them to see their connection, not as I, I voted this way and I helped to put these people in prison. No, their, cre their connection to how we treat children, how we treat public health issues, okay? How we treat, uh, you know, our institution of education. We need to put a racial equity lens, I dare say, on, you know, uh, on parole. But also, if we, like I said, we continue to unravel. Women have, uh, uh, imprisonment has gone up for 400%. So, so what is, what is going on even with, uh, poverty and women and those kinds of things. And then, so it unravels all of these folks on the margin. So I think it's very important for us. We have these three campaign issues, you know, uh, brain science, um, education, and that is the prisoner initiated programs, but also looking at a racial e equity lens on um, sentencing and as well as on uh, re-entry. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think is extremely important to look at legislation. And that's the reason why I was bringing out what um, Rabbi Jay and Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown have been doing in the multi-faith group. When they say multi-faith, and I do mean Jewish people, Muslim people, Christian people, the many different Christian churches come together and discuss things across um, significant differences. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know... It is not like you have to go to prison and volunteer, but you know, it's like Fred Hampton said, open your door and look out. If there's an issue, do something about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things to be conscious of those things. But then also there's a group called the multi-faith group that um, people can participate in. <laughs> Underlying a lot of the arguments and sort of the uh, walls that you need to break through uh, is the argument that, well, people really can't change. And what I've heard each of you say is, yes, they can. And so what I'd like to do as we wrap up this program, this conversation, is just to offer a counter argument to that. I think oftentimes the reason why we we respond to that is because of a lack of consciousness, because of media overload of who is the bad guy, mm -hmm. right? And so instead of interrogating and even listening, a person walks up and has the accoutrements of, of the bad guy. You, you know, it's it's kind of like, I know this sounds crazy, but the, the culture of the Frankenstein movie. People think Frankenstein is the monster. No, right. it's the doctor That's right. who yeah. created Frankenstein. On Halloween, we go get a Frankenstein costume and it's the monster. No, we created the monster, oftentimes. It even gets confused in that little funny kind of thing that I, analogy that I gave you. So there's a, 
And so in order not to do anything, I think we take it hook, line, and sinker that I, I, me in the classroom, I thought I had to really teach these folks mm -hmm. that you know, I had to really do it. And so we are all, I think, impacted by um, othering people. And and I spoke at this, um, the New York prosecutors, no, no, New York defense attorneys um, uh, meeting, and they saw the film and they said, where there are this group called credible messengers, and these are formerly incarcerated people who are doing work in the community, violence and incarceration rates have gone down. Hmm. People don't interrogate that. Mm -hmm. They look at a number and they say, this is it, right? Or they, they they see someone going to prison. There's a pause when it comes to George Floyd, but that pause was over in about eh, three, four months, mm -hmm. those kinds of things, you know, because we isolate issues instead of looking at, at particularly our connection to that. There's a great book called The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, and she talks about what happens when we work together. Right, that it's in all of our interests, and I've seen that in the multi faith group, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Reverend Rabbi, what would you say to that in terms of those who say people really can't change? How can you be a human being and say people can't change? Then there's no hope. How can you be an American? How can you call yourself a good American? and say people can't change. America's about change. The whole country's about change. The country, it was formed on the basis of change, that we don't have to accept the way things are. We don't have to accept the status quo. A person doesn't have to accept their, their birth status. That's the, America's based on that idea. You know, we, we people came over here because they were locked into a society where it was a caste system. And if you were a bricklayer, you know, it, it, it meant that you, you, couldn't, you couldn't be anything else but a bricklayer because that's, that's what you're, your ancestors were going down to the nth generation. America is about, it's completely about change. It's about everybody's ability to transform themselves. And it's about society's ability, not just the individual. It's about the country's ability to change. That's what makes this country great, is change. And what we need to do though, is we need to understand that change is not easy just because we say people can change it. You know, it's not an easy process and this backsliding. Um, you know, that's what, we see that in American history, we move forward, you know, we get excited and then, you know, change is not easy and it's scary to people and people don't like unfamiliar territory. So, you know, there's a tendency to, to move backwards and to want to go back to the way things were, something more safe, something more familiar, even if it's miserable, <laughs> but it's what I know. So I think we need to, we need to have more conversations about how do people change? Not if people change, but how do people change? How do we make those changes stick? And how do we make those changes the most intelligence and the most sensible and the most humane changes? Reverend? And for me, I think it's it's almost the wrong question, though I um, um, honor your brilliance, Jeff. <laughs> but I, I think it's almost the wrong question because um, we've been following the thread of Hollywood that loves to talk about good and evil and to pose it as if it's polarized, as if there are good characters, there are bad characters, and they never meet. But somehow we need to understand that the way that we have been doing policing and incarceration, we have not admitted that there are good people on both sides, that there's the propensity and the possibility of evil on both sides. Mm -hmm. We haven't just determined that there are victims on both sides, that we could look at um, Kamanti Carter and, and, and folks, his peers from that time, and talk about the lack of resources in the community as the real villain, as the real um, thing that needed to be changed, as the fact that there was uh, gang violence due to um, resource, uh, the lack of resources, not simply because there were people who were just sitting around saying, I want to do evil today. I just think that we have an elementary way of thinking about good and evil, and we have an elementary way of thinking about change. And for me, my um, invitation for those who are watching today would be change your mind. And if you change your mind, the people around you will transform. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because if you don't look at folks as permanent criminals or even as permanent victims or even as ones that nobody can ever help or as unlovable, unintelligible and all the other ways that we think about people, 
then I'm not sure where we're left. But this is not about a scarcity paradigm. This is about abundance. And in an abundance paradigm, there's always the ability for transformation, always the possibility of change. And you and I, if we change our perceptions and the way we think about others, we can change this whole world just there on that platform and on that stage of life. And that's an amazing challenge for all of us on the other side of the camera or the desk, uh, myself and all of those of you out watching in terms of how can we change and what can we do to follow the model that's been given here. Uh, Rabbi and Reverend and Gilda, I thank each of you so much for participating in this. I'd love to uh, pick up this conversation maybe a year down the road and see where you're going from that time. So that's an invitation I hope you'll pick up at uh, some point, as I say, a little bit down the road. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of you out there watching this episode of Challenge 2.0. I hope you'll tune in again to the next one. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining, and thought-provoking, and the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable, perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution. Your support will not only help our program continue, it will also support the broader efforts of past understanding our supporting parent nonprofit organizations.